So just very briefly by way of background, my, uh, I, I'm actually at the moment uh, responsible for two kind of organizations. One is my design practice, Touch Design Plus Research, which has uh, been going up for about 12 years and which has been uh, basically building on my background as an architect, uh, designing interactive environments, interactive systems uh, in general, sometimes doing very large scale but temporary works, other times work of more sort of um, uh, exploratory nature. Uh, about three years ago, I spun off a separate company to take care of this platform called Patchbay, um, which is essentially kind of data brokerage for environmental data. And so at the moment, I'm basically um, running two companies, two teams, doing slightly different, but I still think related things. What I wanted to talk to you about today in the context of this, uh, this idea of the future of technology is um, platforms participation. Because I think that one thing that has uh, the common theme in my work for the last uh, probably 12, 13 years has been the idea of designing uh, systems for enabling people to participate uh, in the process of design or a, 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 at the level of the city. Um, and whether I've done installations or whether I've been, um, uh, whether I've uh, been working with electronics or projection or balloons or even now uh, kind of web-based uh, application, it's always been about the the idea of trying to design a system that enables other people to design as well. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you about four or five examples of this. And then I'm going to just finish off with uh, very briefly the kind of strategies that I've learned from this process. Um, this is what, uh, these will be sorts of uh, grand postulates uh, of the kind one makes in a very short presentation without going very deeply into them, but they're the sort of thing that, that I've found has helped me when trying to design a participative system, um, and I'm hoping that they would uh, be of use to somebody over there as well. Um, the first project I'm going to just talk about is uh, called the Reconfigurable House. I'm hoping that the video comes through at a reasonable rate uh, over Skype. This was a collaboration with whose background is also in architecture. Um, and we were basically making a critique of the traditional smart home. Um, by traditional, I mean the idea of the smart home as it's currently being developed by uh, all sorts of technologically oriented um, uh, multinationals at the moment, your sort of Cisco, Microsofts. Um, the idea of the reconfigurable house was that we wanted to show that it's possible to pack very inexpensive sensors and actuators, actually taken from toys, the kinds of things you get for one or two dollars in, in, in a, in, you know, in a, um, in a uh, uh, one dollar shop, um, which these days have quite sophisticated uh, electronics inside them. So there are cats that, for example, respond to uh, uh, sound. Uh, there are penguin walkie-talkies and these kinds of things you can actually buy for a really very inexpensive, um, uh, very, very, very inexpensively. And we wanted to show that it's possible even for a non-expert to, to hack these things, take them apart, rewire them into a sort of, into a kind of uh, a house full of a thousand sensors and actuators. Um, and then also to be able to determine how the sensors and actuators are configured. And so the idea was that we as designers don't determine how the house responds to them. It's the people, the occupants themselves, determine how the house responds to them. That's why it's called a reconfigurable house. This was done um, uh, first about four or five years ago uh, in Japan. And then we did uh, the version you're seeing on video at the moment um, in Belgium uh, a year or two later. Um, and so the touch screen that you see is basically the the screen where the occupants could design their own kind of interaction. They could determine what triggers what, uh, what phenomena are kind of linked together or grouped together. Um, uh, and it was really they who designed what their space did in response to them. Uh, the next project is called Open Verbal. And um, 
Open Burble was uh, a project that was commissioned by the Singapore Biennale. Uh, this was also about five years ago or so. Um, and here, what I was interested to look at was how members of the public could come together to design a structure, very large structure. This is basically 15 stories tall. Um, they assemble the structure. It's made of carbon fiber modules and uh, a thousand helium balloons filled with sensors and LEDs to sort of create colors. And uh, let me actually just uh, rewind that and show that again. And they also then control the, 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 the structure um, in their park where, where they've assembled it. So the idea is that a little bit like Jack and the Beanstalk, where, where they've sort of created something, they've planted something in their backyard, and it may only be for a short time, but they come together to really go through something together that operates at the scale of, of a, a large building. Um, Patch Bay, as I said, is, uh, which actually was a spin-off from the design. And essentially what Patch Bay is, uh, the, um, it's, it's to enable sensors and environments to communicate in real time. Uh, originally, I thought it would be a useful system for getting building management systems to be able to uh, share data um, uh, in real time, because, of course, you know, systems are often built as closed systems, and I wanted to cap capitalize on the kind of openness and also the kind of infrastructure that has gone into building things like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, but apply it to, to buildings and environments. In fact, what it has become is something... Um, much more generalized in the sense that now the system really can talk to pretty much anything that is connected to the, to the network. So that'll be energy monitors, bio monitors, air quality monitors. Um, there are Geiger counters and uh, building management systems, yes. Um, but the, the idea is that because we've made it as easy as possible to connect together different types of entities, and because we've tried to make it as easy as possible to build applications on top of all of this data, actually it's the community themselves that actually figures out what to do with all of these, all of this real-time sensor data. And so there's also an app repository where people can start to build um, or, or contribute things they've built. So there, there are sort of mobile phone apps for looking at um, uh, for looking at uh, Patch Bay feeds, or um, uh, there are augmented reality apps. There are visualization tools. Um, there are uh, there there is a sort of SketchUp plugin, so you can pull in real time data from your site uh, while you're actually designing your building, or you might look at the historical data of a similar building um, that's been publishing to Patch Bay. We now have basically thousands of users around the world, ranging from individuals to companies to even working with we're at the level of the city with with with, with city level data. Um, and uh, we're dealing with basically millions of data points per day coming from all of these uh, very different types of uh, entity. Um, and again, this was, this was the idea of building a platform that enabled people to make things on top of it. Uh, some people have actually described it as the Twitter for machines or Twitter for environments, because in the same way that the Twitter website is less important than the Twitter infrastructure, um, you know, there are sort of thousands of Twitter apps that have been built on top of their, their back end. Similarly, the patch bay infrastructure is the important part. It's, it's enabling this real-time connectivity so that other people can start to build the, the, the tools and applications on top of it. Um, we're currently working on a project uh, up in the north of England, um, and we're building a piece of software called Spaghetti, which is basically it's a kind of... Um, uh, it, it's a, the, the idea to ultimately will be that it's a sort of real-time urban, um, urban element configure and um, controller. And um, essentially in this, um, in this town up north, there is a, there's a public space which is going to be filled with all sorts of technology, technology things like lights and fountains and uh, a digital projector and uh, a camera tracking system. And when I first came to the project, I was very worried that actually there was no real coherent idea of what to do with all of these pieces that were going to be plugged in 
um, which, which the city was very happy about and sort of proud about. But there was real no coherent. There's really no coherent plan for uh, for for designing what the space was going to be like, what this, how the space was going to respond to visitors. Um, and so Spaghetti was basically within a single piece of software trying to make a system for designing the, the public space, for, um, for actually configuring it, and ultimately also for doing the control of it. And so uh, using the same piece of software um, to both design and be the sort of final controller um, uh, is, is a very important part of it because we didn't want to separate out the, the processes of design and execution. And so um, the, this is something that uh, that will also enable people to create plugins for uh, and to have access to the to the source code um, so that they'll be able to build upon it for themselves. Um, Nat Fuse is a project that I built actually on top of Patch Bay, the, um, the, the, in the, the web-based infrastructure that I mentioned a couple of projects ago. And this project is essentially a plant with a power socket on it. And the idea is that the amount of power that's available to the socket is limited by the capacity of the plant to offset its carbon footprint. The idea is essentially that if you use this to power your devices, then you could remain carbon neutral if it weren't for one slight problem, which is that even a single plant will not offset the carbon footprint of uh, uh, even a low wattage light bulb. But the idea is that if there are six plants out there that are not currently being used to offset uh, the energy use en energy consumption of your lamp, if you could borrow their carbon capture and capacity to offset your, your power usage. And so what we do is we use Patch Bay to network together all of these uh, these units. They've been to, we've had them in New York, in London, in San Sebastian, um, and currently in Seoul in, in Korea. And the idea is that if you want to switch on your lamp, then the, um, the unit wakes up and it looks out on the network to see whether there are five or six other plants out there that are not currently being used. And as long as there is another plant out there, it will enable you to switch on your, your, um, your lamp. But the thing is that what we do is we actually have a switch which is where it's not just on off, but where you can choose to be selfless or selfish. And so here what's happening is that if you choose to be selfless and you plug in your lamp, if there's not enough carbon capture and capacity out in the community, then you'll only get enough that it will not harm the carbon footprint of the community. And then uh, if you exceed that, then it switches off your lamp. That's why sometimes the lamp might only be on for a few seconds. If, on the other hand, you absolutely have to um, have energy, you have to switch on your light, then you can choose the selfish mode. And in this mode, you'll get as much energy as you need. But if you harm the community's carbon footprint, in other words, if it goes uh, positive carbon footprint, then it will send a kill signal to somebody else's plant. And the idea here is that the impact of your energy use is felt by others as well as by yourself. Um, and so we're interested to look at the, the kind of social relationships that are uh, defined by technology. Um, so that's the kind of background of the, the work, the kind of different platforms, the different uh, projects that I've been working on. And I just wanted to run very quickly through the, uh, just a sort of set of things that I think that I've learned from this process when trying to design participative systems. The first important thing to realize is that the end goal is not enough of an incentive to get people to participate. So when you do a lovely, you know, you, you come up with a lovely proposal for a wonderful street life full of happy people and uh, wonderful sidewalks and uh, no pollution, that is a not enough of an incentive to get people to participate to work towards that end goal. If it were, then we wouldn't have traffic jams because everyone recognizes that if we all drive properly, that we that we would probably all benefit from uh, from that process. But the fact is that in the middle of a traffic jam, whoever decides to respect other people actually gets penalized the most first. So 
the really important thing in designing a participative system is to think about what the short-term intermediary goals for participation are. What can you do to convince people just to take that first step? The second thing when designing participative systems, I think, is that it's got to be structured in such a way that you, you, you don't need to get everybody agreeing in order to start the project. Um, because if you need everyone to agree, then you'll never start. Because there'll always be people who are skeptical, quite rightly so. Um, and there'll always be people who want to wait and see what happens before they jump in. So actually, the best way to do it is to, to, to structure it so that by incrementally participating, there are incremental gains. The third thing is you can't try to convince people. You can't really... Um, uh, it, it, what might seem self-evident evident to you is not self-evident to other people. Um, in other words, the, the, the gains that you, that you perceive may not be the gains that other people perceive. And so actually it turns out it's a lot easier to spend your time building tools for people rather than solutions because by giving them the tools, it enables them to question the standards of evidence and basically to convince themselves to participate. Um, I have found that a public spectacle is actually a very useful way to get people to consider participating, partly because in public you can actually be anonymous in a, in, in a, in a kind of strange sense. It, when you have a very big crowd of people, there may be a lot of people standing on the sidelines not yet willing to get involved, but there's a certain point at which uh, um, at where, where the, the crowd is so large that anyone who participates really gets lost there, and they can just start to experiment on their own. So as long as you can build the system in such a way that people do feel as though participation is relevant, uh, a public spectacle can actually be a very useful uh, method. Um, the final thing is that the proposition that you come up with when you're designing your participative system may well be so complex that there's really it's actually impossible for a single individual to explain it to others. Um, and I think there is an old idea of design where it's about coming up with solutions or it's about um, trying to simplify things for people. But I think that just doesn't work, and especially doesn't work in the, the kind of complex uh, environment that we uh, exist in at the moment. It's not about dumbing things down. I think the kinds of solutions we're looking to, the, the kinds of complex problems we're facing, require us to have actually relatively complex um, solutions that involve multiple players and involve multiple disciplines. And as I said, quite likely are so complex that no single individual will contain all of that knowledge. And with that, I will thank you very much.